Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, verses 5 through 17. Listen for the word of God. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I am then bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just, I, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. I know it was 20 years ago because I was pregnant with my 20-year-old son. So 20 years ago, I was sent to a failed new church start to see whether it could be turned around or should close its doors. I love these people, but I had never seen such a messy group of people. <laughs> they had all the money in the world, but all they did was fight about it. They'd created great youth and family programs, but they'd forgotten how to work together as a church family. They had amazing creative worship. That's what they were known for. They were setting up and breaking down their very unique worship space in an elementary gym every single week. But for all that hard work, the spirit wasn't moving. In spite of all their perfect programs and all that creative worship, what they truly excelled at was fighting with each other. They were so good at it that they were destroying their new church start. This new church that had once grown to 300 members was now down to 100 after a big fight. So in I went with my team of experts, our mediator, she was amazing, offering conflict resolution. I think she listened to 90 conversations that first three months. Our strategist led these visioning sessions, got people focused on their purpose and God's call. I preached what I hope were inspiring sermons. The worship team was creating amazing, spirit-filled, well, not as spirit-filled as I wanted it to be, but it was uplifting and creative worship every single week. It ought to be working. Every week, I would say in staff meeting, it ought to be working. But something just in right here. Every time we gathered, there was an underlying t tension. Every decision was a fight. You know, sometimes it was like, are we going to set up 100 chairs this week or 150? And we'd fight about it. Really? Really, folks? Just put 125. <laughs> they were so afraid to talk honestly with each other, so afraid to listen deeply for fear of what they might hear, that they didn't talk at all. They were afraid that they were never going to build. They were afraid that they might have to close their doors completely. Fear was running the show. Until one Sunday morning, when our lay leader, Jerry, stood up at church and asked for prayer. We did that in that church. But this time, it was a really desperate prayer. He needed a new kidney. Both of his were shutting down, and the doctor had said, no more dialysis it's a new kidney or it's hospice. Jerry was young, 50, 55 maybe. 
So we laid hands on Jerry, we prayed over Jerry, we cried, we sang, we truly worshiped that day. And then the next night, it was church council where we did our best fighting. <laughs> but something was different that night. Jerry was missing, and yet he wasn't missing. His presence was in the center of every conversation. Suddenly we were talking more honestly. We were listening more compassionately. We knew this church had to continue because Jerry needed us. The next week in worship, Jerry's wife got up and announced that a donor had been found. Our prayers had been answered. The week after, Jerry was absent for his surgery, and we looked around and we noticed Steve was also absent. And since he was the head of the prayer team, he was never absent from worship. And we suddenly realized who the donor must be. Everything changed for the church that month. My preaching didn't get any better. The worship services didn't get more creative. But suddenly, we remembered to love each other. If Steve could give his kidney for Jerry, a man he barely knew apart from Sunday worship, the rest of them could surely forgive the old hurts and wounds they had inflicted on one another. And they could start loving each other again. And as they did that, I watched this group of people become not so messy anymore. They became the loving people they were meant to become. And they finally started putting hands and feet to all that training and work that we'd been doing for months together. But it all began with Steve's sacrificial gift for Jerry. The church indeed did start growing again. Not because of my great strategies and not because of their great programs, but because of their great love. Through Steve's life-giving gift to Jerry, the church and I learned a lesson that I have never forgotten. All the right actions and tools and rules cannot make a bit of difference unless the work, the tools, the rules are undergirded by the only work, tool, and rule that matters. Love. Love is the foundation that connects us to God and connects us to each other with God's powerful spirit. When Steve lay down on that operating table to give a kidney for Jerry, he knew and we knew that he was possibly laying down his life for a friend. This scripture has landed very differently for me since that experience. It has inspired me in a way I might never have understood if I had not been witness to this amazing moment between these two people and the way that their amazing connection impacted the life of an entire church. These are ancient words, but they were new words when they were written down. When these words in the Gospel of John were written, Jesus had been dead and gone for many years. But his followers somehow remembered this lesson so much so that they wrote it down. They remembered well the gift of life that Jesus had given to them, not only in his death on the cross, but through the life that he lived, the life of love that he gave so generously every time he healed, the life of love that he taught every time he preached, the life of love that he courageously pursued even when the scribes and the Pharisees were after him. Jesus had been walking alongside them as his, their master and guide, teaching them with his actions, with his words, with his prayers, with the risks that he took, that the very foundation of every lesson is love. Now, a lot of the early Christians in John's community had not actually met Jesus. They had become Christians later in the game. But even though they didn't know Jesus in the flesh, they knew Jesus' gift of life-giving love was a lesson 
for every Christian to learn. And so they wrote it down so that it isn't just a lesson for then, it is a lesson for now. Jesus' gift of life-giving love is not an old-fashioned lesson for just those ancient times. It's an example for all of us in every time. Jesus says to us, you are my friends. He's calling us into this loving connection, this intimate friendship with him. And then Jesus calls us to live out that friendship by caring lovingly for one another. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love, Jesus says. This is my commandment, that you should love one another as I have loved you. Think about that, how deeply Jesus loves us. That's how deeply Jesus wants us to love each other. This is not an easy command. I mean, you think about the life he lived and the death he died, and you realize this is not just a quick love ya to be dismissed as you walk out the door. This is a love that took Jesus all the way to the cross. This is a love that took Steve to the operating table for Jerry. This is a love that can take all of us to miraculous places of selflessness, generosity, even sacrifice. This is a love that is not logical. There's nothing in it for you. There's nothing in it for me when we give it. We got to be all in, as Kathy said, to give this kind of love. But I got to tell you, this is the type of love that sets us apart as the followers of Jesus. This is the love that gives so generously, so selflessly, so sacrificially that we might find ourselves laying down our very lives for another. This love is what transforms our lives. This love is what helps us to transform the lives of others. This love is so powerful that it can create new life. It's a love so powerful that it brought Jesus back from the dead. It is a love so powerful that we can bring life back. It was this type of love that led Steve to give one of his kidneys to save Jerry's life. Not because they were best friends. They weren't. Not because they were relatives. They weren't. Not because Steve owed Jerry any favors. He didn't. Not because the church was calling for donors to go see if they were a match. We weren't. But because the Spirit nudged Steve to share his life with Jerry in that profound gift of sacrifice and self-giving love. We are all called to live this kind of love in our own Christian communities and in our own unique ways. It's not likely that one of us is going to be called to donate a kidney to another church member. But if that's where the Spirit calls one of us to go, I hope we'll go. It's not likely that one of us is going to be martyred for our faith, as many in John's community were some 2,000 years ago. But we will be called to love people we don't expect maybe even to love people we don't like. We will be called to love in places we hadn't anticipated. We will be called to love in ways that we don't necessarily feel prepared for. Love will call us. Love does call us. Love is calling us calling us to connect with each other, to connect with Christ, and to connect with God's world. Love is calling us each and every day, 
calling us to shape our lives around love, to create connections through the power of love. Last fall, I was leading a Bible study on this passage of Scripture. I was using a story from my book, The Gospel According to Beauty and the Beast. You know me and fairy tales. <laughs> if you know the film, you know that as Beast lies dying in the end, it's only the power of Belle's love that can save him. Ultimately, the fairy tale ending only can happen in that book and in that story and in that film when they are willing to give their lives for each other. So I asked people in this Bible study to reflect. These were really powerful Christian leaders, long-time followers of God. And I asked them, when have you ever given love in a, this kind of sacrificial or self-giving way? At first, everyone in the Bible study objected. Oh, no, 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 Pastor Mary, I've never loved that way. Oh, no, I'm not that good of a Christian. I'm working on it, but I'm just not there. Oh, no, no, I've never given that generously before. I've never laid down my life for someone else's life. The circle of conversation grew silent. As we all reflected on that challenging question, have I ever given myself for another? But then one woman there broke the silence. She turned to another one and said, actually, you've given that way to me. Remember when I went through that horrible divorce and you took me in, though there was not room in your tiny little house and you did not have extra money in the bank account to pay for another. But you welcomed me with wide open arms, you never asked for a penny of rent, and you fed me dinner every night and wiped my tears when I cried myself to sleep. All of a sudden, the conversation started flowing like a floodgate had been opened. Each one in that room knew of a time when someone else had given sacrificially. They just couldn't see it in themselves. And as we heard the stories, we began to see ourselves differently. We began to recognize the times when we had given. And we began to recognize we were in the presence of some saints. I mean, I, I was surrounded by some people who had such deep friendships that they had truly given and cared for one another over a decade of friendship that was so powerful. That powerful circle of connection was powerful because of the foundation of love. They had all experienced some sort of self-giving love from another person in that room. They had seen one another give it to others in their church, their families, their community, and now they were able to name it and recognize the powerful transformations that they had experienced and seen in others' lives in each of those instances of giving or receiving this kind of powerful love. You see, we don't have to be martyred to give in this way. Jesus' death on the cross is intended to prevent that very thing so that we don't have to feel some sense of guilt driving us to follow the rules that destroy our self-worth. Jesus doesn't want us to love or give in a way that makes us doormats to be trod upon. Jesus came that we might have life and that we might have life abundantly so that we can love out of that abundance. God wants us healthy and whole, strongly connected to Christ, our vine, so that we can bear fruit, the fruit of giving love freely and joyously and abundantly. Bearing the fruit of love is our calling. And sometimes that call will challenge us to a love that is self-sacrificing. And when that moment comes, our self-giving love will connect us to God in a way that will transform us. It will connect us to one another in a way that nothing else ever can do. When we love this way, we become partners with Christ. When we love this way, we are mutually loving God's people and God's world on God's behalf. When we love this way, we are freeing the Spirit to flow through us so abundantly and so powerfully that nothing can stop it. By loving in this way, 
we are inviting divine love to intermingle with our love so that we're transformed into the beautiful images of God that we were meant to be in the first place. And when our love intermingles with divine love, something mysterious and magical happens. I mean, crazy miracle things happen. Like a man donates a kidney to somebody he barely knows. A runaway finds a safe haven in the home of an estranged grandparent. Enemies become friends, hungry children are fed, and the world looks a little more like the kingdom of God. And that's a powerful moment. My friends, when this divine love is flowing through us, we are interconnected with God, like those fruit-filled branches of grapes connected to a vine so strong, so old, so nurturing, that it can grow grapes through every branch, every branch that connects through the power of love. That's how God works, sending beautiful fruit into the world through each and every one of us so that we become the gift to God's world, that we are creating this life-giving love because of God's Spirit flowing through us. That's what happens. When love starts flowing through us, we do produce those fruits of peace and patience and joy and compassion and kindness and even forgiveness. I like to think of us kind of as fruity. I kind of like it. We get to be fruity when we let the fruit of the Spirit flow through us. The products of love flowing through each of us not because we're all that great, but we are created to be connected to the greatest one, who is the vine of life, who is love itself. As followers of Christ, we are called to this self-giving love, not because we have to, not because anybody forces us to, but because we feel called to do so, and because the Holy Spirit living in us makes it possible. When Steve sensed that call, he didn't hesitate. Just went to the hospital to see if maybe he was a match and discovered he was. No surprise why the Spirit was nudging him, huh? Three years later, I stood with Steve and Jerry as Jerry and their new pastor pushed those shovels into a big pile of dirt that would soon house the cornerstone and foundation of the new church they were building. Jerry, who had once been too sick to stand and sing a hymn, was now digging in the dirt and building a new church with his brother Steve and their entire family in Christ. Tears flowed as we clapped and laughed together, smiling through our tears as we thanked God for their church that was thriving and growing and making their community a better place each and every day. As the ceremony ended, Steve and Jerry hugged, and a cheer went up from the crowd. In front of our very eyes, we were seeing the fruit of their love, a new church building, a loving church family, and two men healthy enough to share in that joyous day. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, vine of life, help us to love one another as you love us. Help us to live as the beloved community you call us to be. Flow through us with your mighty spirit so that your loving spirit guides every word, every thought, every action. Love through us so that in us, others may discover the beauty and power of your love right here and right now. Amen. 
Will you join me in the praying of our Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not.